applause, Harley Davidson, the FX GTS Sport Live. Bill, I'm in the mood for a switch up. I hit the function, hit the rose right till I hiccup. I hit the stage and leave with money that's a stick up. She picture perfect, so I told him I'm All right, welcome everybody out to another Laid Loss Harley Davidson podcast. This is episode number seven. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Okay, my bad. Shoot, we're yep. just doing them too quickly. I, I lost track. So. We're going to kind of tackle a, a unique topic here, and it's a topic that it seems like is kind of a hot topic right now that a lot of people want to weigh in about, um, you know, Harley Davidson's pricing. And so we're going to take a deep dive into pricing. And we have a guest here today. Um, he's actually a, an employee here at the dealership. We have Nick Culver here. And Nick has kind of made this a little bit of a, a pet project of his. Um, he was actually going to do a video for the YouTube channel, but. We felt like it would be a little bit more appropriate and maybe the discussion would flow better if we did it in podcast format. So, yeah, Nick, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. What's up, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Keith, obviously, uh, here as well. And we're going to get into a, a tech topic. We're going to go into a little bit on the stage, too, as well, that Keith is going to be doing the, the majority of the information uh, on that topic as well. So, um, yeah, so to kind of introduce the topic a little bit more and, and start off, so... I feel like, you know, I, I did this video a little while ago, I want to say two or three years ago, and it kind of sparked a lot of conversation around the whole pricing topic. And it was it was kind of when Harley Davidson started to see a little bit of a slump in sales. And some of the main points that I brought up during that video were that just the motorcycle market in, in its entirety, we're talking all bikes across the, the, the landscape of motorcycles were declining as a whole. It wasn't just you know, Harley specifically. And, you know, I, I attributed that to a few things, you know, just the way people are raised now and just uh, the barriers to entry into riding a motorcycle and a few yeah. other things I won't repeat right now. But um, price wasn't one of the things that I brought up. And just about every other comment on that YouTube video uh, was it's price, 100% price. Sales are down because Harleys have gotten too expensive and they're no longer affordable. They used to be affordable, but no, now they're no longer affordable. And I was, I was a little kind of shocked, but not really uh, at people's response to that. And it seems like I, I see those videos reoccurring or, or those comments, I should say, on, on videos I've done now. And it seems like, you know, Harley Davidson's in, in the spotlight right now um, because they're, they're undergoing a lot of changes and, you know, their stock's down. Um, we're actually on an uptick right now, which is kind of interesting. We're actually selling more bikes now than we did last year, but... Um, as a whole, the motor company has seen some declining sales in the last, you know, five years, we'll say. Um, and everybody wants to say, well, it's because of price. I think that's kind of the, the general public consensus is, is that it's price, among other things. But, um, yeah, Nick did a very deep dive on this topic, <laughs> and he really got into uh, – he's, he's somewhat of a, a, a scholar, um, just the way he goes about researching things and, and talking about things. So – um, l let's have you kind of kick it off for a minute, Nick, on, on, you know, the first bullet point or topic on this uh, subject. As Matt mentioned, I have a tendency to, to go down rabbit holes. Um, and it's a blessing and a curse. It means I spend a lot more time thinking about things than I probably should, um, that really don't affect my life in any appreciable way other than probably lead to frustration. Um, but, uh, in this instance, I think it's a, it's a good discussion to have because it's all something that we're very intrigued by is, you know, the question of, why are sales declining? What Harley can do to try to improve those sales? Because yeah. it seems like everyone's recommend you know recommendation on any YouTube video that we post is going to be it just needs to be less expensive. It's so a great price. Bike. Yeah, I yeah, want so. the bike. I want the bike, but I want it for ten grand. Or I want the bike. I want the bike, but I want it for five grand. So that's the discussion. Basically, top of that comes up every single time we post pretty much any video, um, including ones that are not at all related about price. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to do a deep dive into it, and really, I I kind of ended up subdividing it as I did more and more research um, into the topic into two different categories. So, uh, cause there's really two separate questions or two separate arguments being made. One is that Harleys are more expensive than they used to be, right? Because if sales are declining and they were higher at one point um, and then that means something must have changed, right? And so if, if you're saying it's price um, or you're saying that Harleys are too expensive, then the argument needs to be made that, well, something has happened when they were before they must've been cheaper and now they must be more expensive. Um, if price is the reason they're not selling well, right? So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the same or similar coin would be that they're just too expensive in general. Um, that, you know, 
you people just can't for, afford them. Yeah. Um, and those are two different questions. I think more expensive than they used to be is an easier question. It's less abstract. Abstract. You can just look at numbers. Is the bike actually more expensive? It has the price gone up over the years. Um, but there's a fair amount of depth that you can actually go into that too, because there's different ways to try to figure out how expensive something actually well, is. Yeah, it depends on how far you want to go back. I mean, everything's more expensive than it used to be. Yeah. So how far, how deep you want to go on that. Exactly. So, so that's one thing yeah. we're going to go into. And that's really where I want to start. Uh, yeah. Let's talk, tackle that one first, Nick. Okay. Cause like you said, that's probably the, the lesser of the two, as far as time required to explain it. Yeah. So, um, basically there's a few different ways that you can try to figure out how expensive something is. So you can just look at the price. So um, let's just look at MSRP for the bike, right? Um, if you just look at uh, the MSRP for an Iron uh, 883 from 2019 to 2020, it didn't change, right? So you could say the price stayed the same. There was 9,000 or it was $8,999 in one year. The next year it was still $8,999. Um, so one way you could look at it is to say it stayed the same price. Um, I would argue that it actually got cheaper. Um, because of inflation, uh, as Keith said, everything is more expensive, quote unquote, today yep. than it was 10 years ago, for the most part, unless there was some crazy manufacturing improvement that has made it way, way cheaper to make that product. Um, but in general, almost everything has got a higher numeric value assigned to it. But the actual price, I would argue, um, is is now lower. Um, because, because of inflation. Because of inflation. Right. So there's tons of inflation calculators that you can look up online. Um, and if you just start plugging in random Harley models, like I did, because as we discussed, I go down rabbit holes here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you, you try to pick, you know, obviously some models that overlay. So, um, I, at first I was just kind of, I was like, okay, well let's look at, uh, a 1985 FXR, right? Because my father has a 1985 FXR. What did it cost to buy one of those new in 1985? So MSRP was 8,500 bucks. Um, now if you account for the inflation, that puts the price actually in today's money at $17,751. So that's 20% more expensive than if you walked into a dealership and tried to buy a brand new lowrider today um, for a bike that had, I mean, objectively it was worse in pretty much every single way than, yeah. than the, the new lowrider in terms of technology, yeah. power, handling, everything. I mean, the FXR is kind of a weird, uh, you know, halo bike that we <laughs> kind of all look back on fondly for a variety of reasons, but like, the fact of the wrote, matter is the new yeah. lowrider is better yeah, than if the you FXR. Wrote a, yeah, I mean, obviously, everyone's thinking about modified, you know, FXRs at this point, but it, bone stock, bone stock, right? You, there wouldn't be even a comparison between yeah. two. And it's yeah. cheaper, right, if you account for inflation. Um, but that's not the only model, right? So maybe the FXR is an anomaly. So let's look at a Street Glide in 2010. Let's not go as, you know, back as far. Um, brand new uh, in 2010, MSRP was 18999 now, uh, it's about twenty one nine. Yeah, not including any options like the radio. Yeah, or depending on what model you're, the ABS no longer ABS is no longer an option anymore. Yeah, uh, but and RDRS is an option. So we'll see. It's it works about twenty two. Yeah, so it actually works out to be uh, like about a thousand bucks, depending. It, it, you can't really comparably option them. So right, they're pretty much the same price. If you look at a T Sport uh, Dyna and you look at the new Sport Glide. New Sport Glide is actually cheaper than the T-Sport Dyna ones. So the story is pretty much the same across the board, um, that the bikes overall, if accounting for inflation, have gotten cheaper. And they've gotten better. So you, yeah. have, you get so a better getting, bike, yeah. better technology now, and for the price money. Yeah, is less money. Yeah. yeah, for comparatively less money. Yeah. 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 So when you account for inflation. Yeah, when you account for inflation, which you kind of have to if you're going to be comparing things from the past to now, um, pretty much every model has gotten cheaper. Uh, but obviously the sentiment is that they haven't. Um, cause everything we hear now is that they're too expensive. Right. And that's the argument for why they're not currently doing well. So, um, if they were more expensive in the past and they're cheaper now, but price is the reason now that they're not doing well, you have to, it just, there's, there's no logical, you know, train of thought there that, that makes sense. So, yeah. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't too expensive, which is the other side of that coin that we were talking about earlier when I divided that. <laughs> You know, yeah. because they could actually be cheaper now than they were in the past, but still be too expensive. Right. People could still not afford them depending on other things. Yeah, it just right? depends on if your, you know, wages matched inflation and probably in most segments of the world, it really hasn't in late as of late. So yeah, it's a matter of perspective of like, hey, I'm not making as much more as that bike it perceivably has increased in price. Exactly. So, yeah. So that's the 
kind of the other factor for trying to calculate price would be um, you know purchasing power. So, so we um, so just get that out of the way. We've squashed the theory that bikes used to be cheaper, yeah, um, than they are now. So yeah, you know, a lot of guys will say like, yeah, well, I can't hardly go back to the good old days where you know the the average blue collar worker could afford a bike. Yeah, that argument we've squashed that. Yeah, at least from the perspective of what Harley can do. Like they've already made the bikes cheaper. So they're selling them for less than they sold them in the past. So yeah. um, it can't just be strictly a price yeah. component that, that Harley can control at least, right? Like we said, but they could still be too expensive because obviously another component of that is going to be the purchasing power, right, of your dollars. So how much money is the money what we're talking about? It's something we all deal with if we're going to go on another you know trip to another country. We think about what's the purchasing power of my dollar relative to this other country. Well, you can do that, but actually you can do it as a time traveler as well. What's my purchasing power for my dollar today versus mm-hmm. in the past, right? So inflation is one component of that, but also you know, how much money you're getting paid is going to be another component, right? The purchasing power of any one given you know citizen is going to vary depending on how much they're getting paid. Yeah. So um, that brings you into the, the question of are, are they too expensive? And um, this is something that you kind of have to get down to a, a pretty fundamental level. Um, and this is really where the rabbit hole stuff started, you know, really sucking me in for mm-hmm. a long period of time. And I, I don't know if you can see this, but I've now, I've written, this is longer than the pretty much every essay I wrote in college. <laughs> Nick, um, Nick still thinks he's in college. Yeah. Like, like Nick, I give him. Nick, like, you need a hobby, Nick. I think this, yeah, <laughs> I need a, I need a girlfriend is what I need, but this need is a hobby also, other than riding this motorcycles. Is, this is simultaneously the need for a girlfriend <laughs> and the reason I don't have one. Right. Um, Nick uh, thinks he's still in school. You know, yeah. we don't require that here at laid laws if you're employed. Here, no, you know? that's a teacher in you, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's another thing I forgot as I was writing this. I was like, oh, man, I'm, am I really, like, qualified to talk about <laughs> economics, even at this superficial level? And then I realized, wait, actually, I'm technically a licensed California teacher for economics. There you go. Um, for those of you listening on the podcast and can't see this, he's got about a 10-page uh, yeah. essay written out. It's Don't shortchange me. This I is 14 pages. Like, yeah, 14, okay, 14. 14. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, it's double-spaced, so it's only about, I think, 6,000 words, but... Uh, anybody needs a ghostwriter we got nick (laughs) nick's for hire (laughs) yeah this was all unnecessary um but fun and i think going to be interesting in in a lot of ways so um basically the first thing that i wanted to talk about was just that component of are they actually more expensive than they used to be and the simple answer is at least within harley's control they're not right harley is currently selling them for less than they sold them in the past um so uh, other than shifting priorities, rent, you know, stagnating wages, whatever other, you know, reasons you want to throw at them, it's, it's in terms of the actual price of the bike, it's less than it used to be. Um, so I guess now we kind of have to move into the are they too expensive uh, question, right? right. Um, and so the first thing I kind of want to address is demand um, because this is a very fundamental thing. You know, when you're, when you're trying to fix a company, when you're like, hey, um, in the YouTube comment section and you're trying to strategize what Harley needs to do, to fix their their current slump, um, and then you're just throwing things out, um, you know, and usually it's price. You, you need to take a step back and think about actually how companies operate um, at a at a more fundamental level. And so, I want to talk a little bit about demand, um, the economic concept itself. Um, it's something that we actually all instinctually know pretty well, um, but it's not something that we really break down in a way that helps us make decisions um, for companies because it's just not something we normally have to do. Um, but people tend to confuse demand and quantity demanded. And these are really, don't worry, the only two economic terms that I'm going to actually go into hopefully minimal detail with just enough so that it makes sense. But um, basically demand is best thought of as uh, essentially, are you in the market for something? So um, the example that I would typically use with like students is uh, think about water. Okay. So everyone in this room, we are all in the market for water, right? Because we're yep. humans, okay? And the only people not in the market for water are people that are not in the market at all. So, like, if you're if you are a lumberjack, you live in the woods, you don't buy anything, you don't deal with currency, you just live off the land, then you're not in the market for water because you're not in the market. But everyone else in the market is always in the market for water. And it's irrelevant of price. And that's because price is not a determinant of demand, okay? So if you think that Harley can increase demand for their product by lowering the price, then you don't understand the difference between demand and quantity demanded. Um, but that's why I'm going into this water explanation because we are all in the market for it regardless of price. Okay. Yep. Um, and that 
you know, is helpful to think about. Um, so the first thing is, let's say water is a million gallons, or it's a million dollars a gallon. Okay, we're probably going to demand less water, but we're still in the market for it. Um, and then we're going to not have pools, probably. We're not going to be watering our lawn as often. We're not mm-hmm. going to be doing those things. Yeah. We might actually all die because we can't afford water, um, but we still wanted the water. We just weren't being, we weren't allowed to buy it, essentially, because we couldn't get over that hurdle of the price. Um, and then in the opposite direction, if water is extremely cheap, we're going to be more likely to have pools. We're going to be taking longer showers. We're going to be watering our lawns. There are going to be beautiful green lawns everywhere. Um, this is important because <clears throat> you then move into quantity demanded, and that's where price actually matters. So that's what I was just describing there. So sure. as price went down, we had more pools. We had longer showers. All that kind of stuff went up. So more gallons of water were bought, right? But in terms of being in the market and actual demand for it, it didn't change. Um, So if we then apply that to Harleys and we're thinking about Harleys from the perspective of demand, okay, uh, price is not going to have more people enter the market for Harleys. We will sell more Harleys if we lower the price, okay? And the manufacturers of pretty much any good do this when they want to sell more units. And it's not, sometimes it's a little bit more invisible than it is in other situations. So maybe it'll be a financing promotion. So, um, you know, the bank and the motor company knows that they make X amount of dollars on the loan. If they lower the interest rates, they're going to make less money. It's a, but Walmart. They know, it's a Walmart theory. Yeah, but they know they're going to yeah. sell more of that good. Um, <clears throat> so they also do that through like trucks. Trucks are a great example for everyone to know. End of the model year comes around. They've got a bunch sitting on their lot. They want to move them. They lower the price. Yep. So they lowered the price and they sold more of them. And they increased the quantity demanded. Not, yeah. not so much the demand, but yeah. the quantity demanded. If you were in the market for a truck, but you didn't want to spend forty five grand. When they lowered the price down to thirty-five grand, suddenly you didn't suddenly just jump into the market. You were already into the market. You just weren't a buyer until it got to thirty-five grand. Yep. Just like we're probably all in the market for Lamborghinis, right? I would assume. Yeah. Anyone, anyone here not want a Lamborghini, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's just when you get to the table and you realize you have to pony up three hundred grand that 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 becomes the hurdle, right? Yep. So, um, the reason I want to bring this up is that just in our comment section, price gets fixated on, um, but it's actually not the issue because. If you then take what I just discussed, which is a pretty superficial level concept, you know, uh, discussion of demand, and then you apply it to how the company thinks about things, okay? If you're basically arguing that the company's not doing well because they're overpricing their goods, you're basically arguing that they're both greedy and also not greedy at the same time. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're selling a good and you have a giant margin on it, okay? And you're not selling very many of them, but you refuse to cut the margin down. You refuse to lower your price tag, essentially what you're doing is you're actually hurting your own ability to make money. So every company of the scale of Harley Davidson is going to have people that literally are looking at, okay, we're going to, at this price, we're going to sell X number of units. We're going to make Y profit. They're going to multiply those together and they're going to say, we're going to make this much money. And then they're going to make another line where they say at this price, we're going to sell how many more units while making how much fewer money, you know, per, per bike, and then multiply that across and compare it. And then, By doing that a bunch of number of times and hopefully accurately predicting the number of units that they sell at each price, they're going to then price their product where they maximize their profit. Okay. So um, if Harley was just greedy currently, right, and had some crazy amount of margin that they could right now in theory cut. Which, let me stop you right there, is what I think everybody assumes assumes that that Harley has this huge margin because everybody thinks that Harleys are are priced way over. Uh, comparative competitors, which is not the case either. Yeah. We'll get into that later. Yeah. But everyone thinks that they had this huge, just fluff margin there. Exactly. So the issue with that theory, though, is that it's assuming Harley is greedy, which, I mean, depending on how you frame the perspective of companies, right? Every company's goal really is to make money. Um, you have to also assume that they're going to do what's in their best interest financially. And it's not in their best interest to not lower the price to sell more product if that's what's actually hurting their ability to make money and sell their product, right? Um, so it's just, again, one of those logical trains that it sounds nice in theory to just say, oh, it's because their their product, they, they, they're priced too high and they're greedy and they just want all this money for their badge. Um, except for that they literally have people whose job is to go, okay, well, if we lowered the price by $3,000 and we sold uh, 20% more units and we took, uh, you know, a 50% cut of our margin or whatever the margin is, you know, um, 
we would actually make more money at that price tag. And as a publicly traded company, you know, Harley wants obviously to make as much money for their shareholders as possible. Well, they it's, would it's, just, it's their obligation too. Yeah, like yeah. They're, they're legally bound to make yeah. as much money as they so can. If price were the issue in that way that we just described, Harley would inst it would be amazing. Harley would instantaneously be able to fix their problem and they would do it and they would have already done it. Yep. Um, That's an easy fix. It's an easy fix and it, it, it's actually just a problem that just doesn't actually exist um, for the most part um, because of how easy it is to fix and because you have literal market analysts who are, you know, like watching and pricing things. Um, it doesn't mean that mistakes are never made. You know, products come out that companies assume are going to do well, and then they don't do well. Um, yeah. Usually then you see corresponding price cuts before the product is either then profitable because they lower the price enough to boom, you know, boost sales enough, or the product gets canceled because it's just not going to be a profitable thing because demand for that product was um, basically calculated wrong. People thought there was going to be more demand, but there wasn't. But lowering the price doesn't actually, as we discussed, Increased demand. Um, well, the, the proof in what you're saying is, and I was I've been around long enough to know been around when Harley had a waiting list for bikes. Like yeah. it was, they didn't they didn't change the price at all, and we just already proved earlier that the price is basically the same, including inflation as it is now. But people would wait, you know, six, nine, ten months sometimes for their motorcycle in, in the model and color they wanted to come in, and have already put down a substantial amount or some in some places even paid it off completely before it ever even showed up. And the demand was there. There, Harley didn't just say, okay, we're going to start making a bunch more bikes for a couple different reasons. One is they were a little bit capacity constrained then, but they could have produced more bikes by running the assembly line, you know, 24 hours a day, which they could have easily done, but they didn't. And one thing that in my, you know, life that I've noticed with Harley over my career is they're very good at this, this method of controlling the, you know, the flow of motorcycles. They have this over, they've revised it on countless times now of this allocation, you know, um, equation and it's a whole different thing than it ever, than it was when I first started doing this. Yeah, but they they have that in place for that reason to try to, you know, control, not control as much, but try to temper the market and keep pricing fair and not too, you know, not, too, so low that people aren't you know making money but also not so high that it's like they're not starving the market out exactly you know that's an, and well, that's right now that's a perception and i think and you know people are starting to like forget about the fact that the f everybody shut down for several months and couldn't produce anything or ship anything and so like they're thinking hardly starving the market by trying to and trying to drive prices up which isn't really the case you know on purpose they're not doing that yeah. they just they can't get the bikes out of the factory for covid reasons and it's yeah, it's that thing. It's a big perception thing right now. You know, dealerships floors are empty. Ours is pretty, pretty, pretty low. But yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. Well, and and Keith too to add what you said. Not only were people dealing with the waiting lists of yeah. Harley Davidson back in the late nineties or the two thousands, but a lot of dealers were marking them up over MSRP yeah. too. So not only ha have the prices relatively been the same or actually gone down, you know, based on what Nick just said they have actually been in inflated back in those days um, above MSRP on top of that. And, and that didn't affect the demand either. Yeah. And the only people that were like actually making out like bandits back then were used bike sellers. Like the used bike market was r crazy back then. I mean, they were going for retail plus sometimes. Oh yeah. You'd buy a new bike, yeah, ride it for a year and sell it for what you bought yeah, it for. Yeah. Not more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it was crazy. A, it was a, it's a crazy upside down example of, <laughs> of economics, honestly. Yeah. So, and that, that kind of brings us nicely to, okay, so well, we kind of established that probably price isn't a determinant of demand, which we didn't actually establish that. That's just like an economic thing that's already been established forever, yeah. right? But yeah, by people that are a lot smarter than we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, then, then the question becomes, okay, well then what, what is a determinant of demand? Because we kind of need to, so if we all agree that there is a sales slump, right, which the numbers don't lie, then, and price isn't the solution, right? Lowering the price tag isn't just going to immediately fix the problem. Then we need to kind of figure out the other determinants of demand and try to figure out where the solution in there potentially lies. So um, the first one that's typically listed is income. And this is something we spoke about before. You know, uh, not only how much you're getting paid, but how much is the cost of other goods that you're buying. So let's say rent prices increase 30% in your community, but your income only goes up 10%. Well, suddenly you've got less discretionary income. So yeah. um, there's a lot of things like that. Maybe you're into both Harleys and trucks, and the price of <coughs> trucks has doubled in the last you know, 20 years, but your income hasn't. So suddenly now a higher percentage of, you know, your money is going to your other discretionary funds and that kind of stuff. So um, income is a big factor. Consumer preferences. So this is just what are people into, 
um, does your product line up with what people actually want? And I know Matt and I and Keith are going to be talking a lot about this later on because this is one of the areas where the motor company and any company really has the most control over what's actually Absolutely. happening. So, you know, this is not only the kind of products you're making, though, it's also your marketing. Um, as we're going to see as we go through this list, just like income, most of these things are actually outside of the control of the company that's operating. So demand, in terms of the levers that the company itself has to pull on demand, they don't have very many. Um, it's mostly in consumer preferences. Um, and then uh, when we get to uh, the price of related goods, you know, making sure that you're uh, competing with- In the market, know, yeah. Yeah, with the other you know goods. Um, that's one area where you can have potentially some control, but obviously you can't control the other companies, which is a factor. Um, but we'll get more into that in a second. There's a number of buyers in the market. Um, so basically if the motorcycle market is shrinking overall, right. Or expanding overall, that's going to obviously change the number, the amount of demand there is for your good. So Harley's doing what they can in trying to address this. It's a difficult lever for any company to pull on. Um, but it's a long-term goal. You know, yeah. you got to train people when they're Expand, young, maybe yeah, they, they can't even afford a Harley at this point, but you yeah. got to trade them now. Yeah. I was just actually, I uh, had a conversation earlier with a, another dealership. Um, and it was same idea was expressed. Like the great thing for us right now, or the great upside for the future going forward is there's so many young youngsters riding dirt bikes now. Like, yeah. and like, case in point if you were to go try to buy a like a like a small cc dirt bike right now for your kid good luck yeah they're They're gone gone. you can't find them and on craigslist or whatever they're way expensive but the good news is for us those kids are going to grow up being loving two wheels and riding and knowing how to ride and having a passion for you know bigger motorcycles and hopefully street bikes eventually and like i was like wow that's a i'm like i remember that one that's a great point and i was like that's actually that's actually awesome yeah. for and, us. And Revzilla yeah. did a whole podcast on yeah. the shrinking size of the motorcycle market mm-hmm. and where it's expanding and where it's not, you know, expanding and what the motorcycle market can do. That's um, interesting, yeah, because I, I always, I send these articles out from a publication online that I subscribe to, uh, motorcycle or Power Sports Business News, right? And uh, they actually, their cover story last month, this last week, actually, for the past month has been... Uh, the motorcycle industry growth in the sale on the sales side and they actually broke it down segment by segment. I don't remember all the numbers, but the overall throughout the country number um, of motorcycles in general, not exclusive of Harley, it was like 56% growth over June of last year. Yeah. And I was like, Whoa, that's a big number. 50, so. 50% more motors, more units are being, you know, put in the population than was a year ago this time. That's insane. I, I really feel like we hit the trough and we're kind of on the way back up yeah. at this point. You know, I'm not talking just Harley. I'm talking about the kind of power sports industry as a whole. I think that's just a guess. I don't know. Yeah, there yeah were, it's, it's always been cyclical too. So yeah. like that same podcast I was talking about, they, they go into detail about how, you know, there's always been kind of boom and bust cycles within the motorcycling, you know, uh, community mm-hmm. in terms of sales, not just again for Harley, but for the, uh, the industry as a whole. So I, I definitely expect that to, to be the case as well. You know, you should always expect that there's going to be contractions and then expansions within yep, any yeah. given particular industry. Anything else, yeah. Um, so number of buyers in the market, as I said, Harley does actually try to pull on this lever more than most other companies, I think. You know, they have the Riders Academy. There's a lot of guys who take the Harley-Davidson Riders Academy, but they don't even, you know, they, they just learn to ride in that, that yeah. class, but they're not actually in, in the market for a Harley, Harley itself. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, um I think Harley's doing a pretty good job there in terms of what they're trying to do. And that was a big part of like the more roads to Harley initiative yeah. was trying to control the number of buyers in the market. So let's say a uh, cruiser market is shrinking. Well, if they move the motor company into the adventure touring segment, now suddenly the number of buyers in your market has expanded because you've entered a new market, yeah. right? So they're, in, they're opening up new segments. Yeah. yeah. Um, prices of related goods, right? So let's say Harley's are expensive. Um, then, you have to look at the related goods to see how they're priced relative sure. to that. And when you actually look at, you know, the price of a gold wing or you look at the price of, you know, Indians or you look at the price of uh, other, you know, bikes like Ducatis and that kind of stuff, Harley's pricing isn't actually that out of line. Um, it just kind of depends on also obviously where you see value. Um, yep. uh, you know, for me, a Louis Vuitton bag is, you know, what I would, you know, in, you know, just day to day conversation, I would say it's incredibly overpriced, right? 
but that's because I don't see any value there. Um, so really where you see and where you place value is going to depend on your judgment call as to whether something's overpriced or not. Um, but uh, this is one of the biggest things I run into all the time, Nick, is, is people will say, and Harleys are so much more expensive than the Indian or than the Honda or, you know, XYZ bike. And really when you talk about, you know, comparative models that, that bring the same thing to the table, like we talked about that R18 BMW coming out. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, like, what, what have we said? 18, 19, $20,000 motorcycle. Um, so I uh, believe, am I jumping ahead? I'm sorry. No, well, no, actually this is the same point where I have it. Okay. So like basically in terms of it's almost like within a few foot pounds and a few horsepower of, of Harley in terms of output. It's actually a little bit less and it's around the same displacement, 1800 CCs. Hence the name, uh, price of the bike is 17,500. It's in terms of features of what it offers. I'd say it's pretty similar to like a soft tail slim. So um, you know, it's got that kind of heritage inspired, you know, 1940s, 1930s. If for them, it's a little bit older, I think, than what Harley's going for in terms of the look. But air cooled, big CC V twin, super high fit and finish. I mean, I'm assuming I haven't seen one in person, but it looks like they've gone all out and they're certainly charging the price tag, which, which is the niche that Harley Davidson goes for, kind of all that, the that vintage retro look, yeah. classic, simplistic, big V twin, air yeah. cooled. Although for Harley, it's it's another thing that you know I'm sure at some point you'll probably have a podcast for. It's almost not vintage because it's just always what Harleys have looked like and yeah. always what Harleys have been. It's why in the comment section of like any Instagram post of like the live wire, you've got people saying that's not a Harley Davidson. Like we were talking about this before, like it doesn't matter what bike Suzuki builds. No one in their Instagram comment section is going to go, that's not a Suzuki. You know, <laughs> no, yeah. like, it's because like yeah. Harley can only without, you know, for some people, they can only build certain things. Right. Um, and so forever they've been building this. Now BMW's building something that's clearly inspired by something from their heritage. And they've done it in a way where it's not just dressing it up. They actually have a big air cooled uh, push rod you know, flat twin. So it's yeah. not just inspired by, but they did that on purpose. Yeah. They did that on purpose. That wasn't was an a, accident. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like what we forgot how to build double overhead cam yeah. motors here at BMW. You decided to go right. back to this. Um, like they're it was not, a deliberate, not they were going after a certain character and based on the price, I'm going to hope that it matches or I'm assuming it won't match just because Harley has a slightly different, um, uh, ability to offer certain prices at, on, on the quality that they offer just because of the, quantity of these bikes that they build like when you think about like the switch gear on a soft tail being all metal i don't know if bmw is going to be able to afford the tooling for that one specific bike right economies have, of scale yeah, as they call it um to have that quality so i wouldn't be surprised if this actually even though it's more expensive has more plastic on it than mm -hmm. your average soft tail does but let's just say it's equivalent um in terms of fit and finish um or even slightly better it's more expensive has the same power output or a little bit less actually per cc uh than a 114 um and it, it has this old tech, right? Quote unquote, old tech. It's a push rod air cooled bike. Um, but it's definitely one of the coolest looking bikes that BMW has put out in a long time from this kind of standpoint. It's gotten the most buzz. It's gotten a lot of buzz and excitement. When I was at the Eichmann show, like everyone was around that. Yeah. Like no yeah. one was really paying attention. I mean, you were there with me. Yeah. People, people were paying attention to the other stuff that, you know, the GSs and things like that. But that bike by far got the most attention yeah. at the Ike Michelle. Well, yeah, Nick, like Nick alluded to earlier, like Harley owns or I don't, I don't say owns, but it really like invented the large displacement V twin air cooled niche market, yeah. and that's where they reside and live, and that's where they do they their best. It, yeah. It's like In and Out. Yeah. What do they do? They make hamburgers. They do that the better than anyone else out there, right? And that's all they do because that's all they need to do, and they do it better than anyone. Harley's the same thing Like for years when we would, you know, when I started doing this, they would only give us marketing market information for, um, above 500 CC, you know, motorcycle, uh, street motorcycles. They wouldn't even look at anything else outside of that realm because that's the only market we were in and nothing else mattered. I mean, for years and years and years, it was like that. Yeah. So, but I, I, the reason obviously you brought it up is because it represents a really good example of, okay, let's take the soft tail slim and then let's take the BMW R18, the BMW R18 is more expensive, right? So when BMW set out to build a classic inspired, right? With a, you know, a classic engine architecture, um, super premium bike with super premium fit and finish. Again, I haven't seen it in person. So I'm kind of making an assumption here that's going to match the Harley. Um, yeah, I'd say up, you're correct. I've seen it in person okay. myself. So it's going to ends up being more expensive than what Harley has. That's I'd say the most direct comparison. And then, I highly doubt that they could bring something, BMW could bring something to market at the same price point as something like the, you know, the soft tail uh, standard, right? Mm -hmm. 
they probably had to go to this point specifically because it was really the only place that they could have a margin that could justify the bike existing. And the reason why Harley's able to be cheaper is one, economies of scale. Two, you think about BMW, they're not using this air-cooled push rod, uh, flat twin in any other bike, most likely. Maybe they'll have some other heritage-inspired stuff, but they're not going to be using it like Harley does across two of their biggest selling yeah. lineups. Mm -hmm. So spreading out that R&D cost for that motor, it's just they had to charge more than yeah. what Harley can charge for a soft tail. Um, because they just, oh, that's the only way to recoup the cost on that kind of bike. Unless it was a pet project of some engineer there and BMW built it because, you know, it was this kind of halo thing and they were cool with not making much money on it because they wanted to create buzz. So there's, there's, there's definitely exceptions to we have to make money on this particular yeah. product, but there's a reason it's more expensive than the Slim. Um, and it's not because it makes more power. It doesn't. It's not because it's better built. There's pretty much nothing better built than, you know, the soft tail lineup. Um, it's because they don't have the economies of scale. Um, and to build something like this, it's extremely expensive. Even if on the spec sheet you look at it and you go, wow, the BMW F800 that they build, that you know, adventure bike, on, on paper is better in every single way, right? But then you look at the two and you're like, okay, well, I see where the money went and it's not to stuff on the spec sheet. Um, so when you look at actual competitors, um, the pricing right. is, is not really, it's within usually 10%, and that's either because you can't, option them completely equal or this particular model is 10% more, but this particular model is 10% less because, you know, they're on a different platform. Sometimes you get people, cons you know, comparing the scout to a soft tail. And it's like, well, those are two very, very different animals in terms of what you're getting. Um, that's a comment I wanted to make because a lot of times the bikes that people compare to a Harley Davidson aren't a, uh, a, a compare. You can't really draw a comparison. They're in two different categories. Yeah. They're yeah. made with different materials. It's, it's, they're, they're not a comparable bike. Yeah, and people are going to see that as kind of like a cop-out, but it's just not even, it's 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 not. Uh, like, I have multiple metric bikes, um, and I have my Harley. And, you know, when you sit, even like an Iron 883 next to my metric, uh, you know, Italian, uh, arguably probably the best in terms of fit and finish, in terms of how it's assembled, uh, sport bike that you can buy, it still looks like a Fisher Price toy next to the, yeah, just, in terms of how much plastic it. is on there, yeah. in terms of even the simple things that no one notices, but that we talk about in videos and things that like really bug me. So like the, the decal is underneath the clear, which is pretty rare on a sport bike actually, for yeah, them to have cleared over the decal. Usually yeah. it's a vinyl applied on top of the paint because that's cheaper, but they did actually clear over it. But if you look at like a, even a Sportster tank, if you look at the amount of clear over it, you almost can't even see the outline of where that vinyl is applied because they applied so much clear that there it's not actually elevated even though that vinyl is elevated up off the paint because obviously it's applied yeah. and then you clear over it so you have to apply a whole bunch of clear to make it so there's no ridge there or you have to have an extremely thin vinyl right but um if you look at like the mv uh you can see the ridge around yeah. the whole thing and on a on a sportster which is four thousand five thousand dollars less expensive than my bike uh you don't see that ridge unless you catch it in the most absolute perfect light. Sometimes. Yeah, that's one thing Harley's always done well is the, the paint, the quality, and, you know, the yeah. way it looks, like, even factory stock. I mean, I know there's certain exceptions, like, you know, uh, certain uh, bikes that people will point out that, oh, my bike had orange peel or whatever, yeah. but it's very rare. And, you know, they do address that stuff, but that's one, one argument we get into on our side of the house because we repair a lot of these things, and it's like, you know, customers are always asking us, well, is it better to order the Harley paint? It's so expensive. Yeah. Or is it better to just have someone paint it locally? It's like, well, you know, like you're getting a different product. Yeah. There's a whole different process. Like you're getting a brand new piece of metal that has like a, a really quality, you know, finish on it. And not that a local guy can't produce it, but for that price, I mean, it's like, you know, yeah. and is it going to last as long? Yeah. I, I beg to differ. It's not going to last as long. The Harley one's going to last a really long time unless you're abusing it for some reason, but. So, you know, price of related goods, obviously, um, is, is important. Um, we talked a lot about competition, but it's not the only aspect of, of the determinant of demand. So other things that, you know, come to mind would be like gasoline. So if gasoline is cheap, then people are going to buy more things because they're going to ride more. They're going to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you might actually argue too, if gasoline gets expensive, bikes become more attractive because they're more fuel efficient. So that's just one way to think about the fact that it's not actually not just your competition. It's also about other goods in the market that are related to your product. Harley, I'd say on average benefits a lot from this because they have so many aftermarket companies that are making goods because their bikes yeah. are so popular. They have their own product lines, you know, for parts and accessories. 
Um, so overall, I think, you know, Harley benefits a lot from the ecosystem around Harley Davidson um, because it's such a, a big brand. And then the final determinant of demand. So just to recap, because we've spent a little bit of time on some of them and a lot of time on a couple of them is uh, to recap, income is, uh, is a big factor. Uh, consumer preferences, that's going to be, do people like what you're making? Um, and that's, of course, change over time. Uh, the number of people in the market, uh, and then the, pr the price of related goods, which is the one that we just covered now. And then the final one would be like expectations for the future. So um, uh, basically, if you're a luxury category, you know, good, um, like a Harley Davidson is, uh, that's something where what people think, you know, in terms of how, how long am I going to have my job? You know, what's the economy going to look like next year? Basically, you're hit harder by expectations of the future than other things, right? So water, you know, as, as you said, demand for that fluctuates. It's and not at all. Um, yeah. So it doesn't matter what next year's economy looks like. Water is always going to be a popular uh, commodity. Harley, on the other hand, if everyone's terrified the next year, they're not going to have a job. Um, people are going to be less yeah, likely call to buy that. Consumer that, so. confidence. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. that expectations for the future. Yeah. Consumer confidence, that kind of stuff. So if um, I had a dollar for where they came in here and said like, well, I don't need a Harley, but I want a Harley, you know, it's yeah. like, kind of so, a lot of the same lives. Like, yeah. So that's, that's basically yeah. the, the five determinants of demand. And the reason we went through those is because it gives us an idea of what Harley can do to try to increase the number of bikes that they're selling. Um, uh, and as you noticed, price wasn't one of those. So it's, it's like I said, a weird concept to think about because price does directly determine, and it's pretty much the only determinant of the quantity demanded other than, um, you know, well, that's pretty much his price. But if you actually want to shift that demand curve, if you want to increase the number of people looking to buy your product, you've got to pull on these levers here. Um, and some of them are things Harleys can can pull on. Their marketing, you know, making sure they're building bikes that people actually want um, and offering value where people see what they're getting for their money. Um, but actually just lowering the price, it doesn't, doesn't fix the, the problem. Um, and if it did, it would be awesome because Harley could do it instantaneously because they're the ones in control of their price. Um, Let's talk to, uh, for a second. You know, Nick, you and I have talked a couple times about um, the the bikes that are selling well and where they are relative to price point and, and mm -hmm. other bikes in the lineup. And I, I look at the top sellers that we have right now, the Rogue Glide Special, the Lowrider S. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the those are by far the, the two top selling motorcycles right now. Are they the least expensive? No, not even close. No, actually, okay. like our least expensive bikes would be the street series of bikes. And, and they're the worst selling bikes. Yeah, they're the worst selling bikes that we have. And that's because it isn't, price is not a determinant of whether people are in the market for them, right? Right, um, right. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, basically within their respective lineups, the actually the bikes that tend to be more expensive tend to be the best selling, with the Sportster being the outlier, really. Um, the Iron 83 definitely outsells it, although they'd say that uh, every other bike in that lineup, the Iron 1200, I think, offers better value, but... People really like that black denim look. I think yeah. Harley's it's more. It's closer to like the what you would like people would normally see as like the quintessential like you yeah. know basic Harley, Harley Davidson. Yeah. That's the one that's closest to it. Like and it, yeah. it perfectly lines up too with like what aesthetic that a demographic wants. Yeah. They want right. that murdered out yeah. black denim sinister look. And it, it is insanity to me that Harley has not offered that on the Iron 1200 as just one of the optional colors. You know, like I can't, I can't imagine how many black denim Iron 1200s we would sell for just a grand more than Iron 883s. But I'm assuming the reason they don't do that is because they know they would never sell an Iron 83 again. Because um, we have people <laughs> where I explain them to them, hey, in every single way, and you're telling me that the, the 20 bucks a month, right, or the extra thousand bucks if you're a cash buyer, isn't actually the issue. Um, but you're still buying this bike that in every way does not line up with what you're planning on doing as well as this bike right next to it, but just because of the looks. Um, it started out with the Nightster. I mean, the Nightster was hugely popular. Yeah, and then yeah. that, that spurned like this whole, like the, everything we have now, Iron 83, Iron 1200, they're yeah. all kind of offshoots of that original Nightster. The, the Dark Custom yeah. movement, as they called it yeah, back in. Dark 07. Custom, that's right. We sell a lot of Iron 1200s, though, too. We do, I mean, we do. We're completely sold yeah. out of both. But we wouldn't and sell I, any more Iron 83s, I don't think, ever again, if you could get an Iron 1200 in black denim. Yeah, we'd probably sell, yeah, disproportionately way more than the 1200. I yeah. think you're right there. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of times people come in, and maybe they're new to the Harley-Davidson world, maybe they're a new rider, and they just think... Do I need the additional, do I need the bigger engine? Yeah. Even though you and I both know that one isn't going to buck them off. The 1200 isn't going to buck them off the bike. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but people just think, okay, I just want to get some into something that is an easy engine. And, and so they go for the Iron 883. Is it yeah. style based sometimes? Absolutely. Um, but 
I think there's other factors there. But, but anyway, yeah, 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 kind of going back to the whole, um, you know, price point thing, uh, the, the lever that Nick kind of mentioned with, with the kind of that, Har- that Harley Davidson has control over uh, in, in relation to demand is building a product that is really appealing to, to consumers. And that's, that's kind of the lever that I'm always talking about constantly is, yeah. you know, what can Harley be building? Or if, if Harley built XYZ bike, it would slay it. It would do really, really well. Yeah. Um, and they, they did that with the Lowrider S. They built a bike. It's $18,000 bike. Can you get the same frame and engine for a little bit less? Absolutely. You can get, um, well, you can get a, a Street Bob, which is actually a pretty popular bike for four, 14, 5, 15. Uh, spend less. Yes, it's a 107, but it's basically, you know, the same core or bones of a bike. But they still go after the Lowrider S and pay that extra three thirty five hundred dollars more because it has everything they want and they hit uh, a niche really really well and, and so people spend the money they have no problem spending the money no yeah and we don't we, we can't keep them in stock people are getting over we've msrp sold, for those yeah you know? we've been sold out we, all year the reason we've been sold out all, all year is because every other dealer around us is charging thousands over sticker form that's the thing too like the, talking them. Yeah. about pricing like the perception i think you know not here because we don't do this but like in the market in general, you know, in our market, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume other metro markets, there's many dealers that are marking up their bikes, you know, like a dealer markup or a market value mark, whatever you want to call it, yeah. dealer markup, I guess, for argument's sake. Um, every People are have been doing that for a long time, you know, and, and so that, that artificially drives up people's perception of like, oh, Harley, they're too expensive. Yeah. And then they don't come yeah. into a dealership like ours that we don't, put a dealer markup on our bikes never have. And I don't think we ever will, but it's, it, it kind of hurts everyone when people are doing that and they're trying to grab over, you know, over market value car dealers do it on certain models. Like I was in a Dodge dealer not that long ago and they had one of those Nick probably knows whatever it is. The demon, the demon. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this oh, thing was ADM like, on that's the, gonna be insane. yeah, the, like the MSR, the sticker price was like 70 K. Right. But it was priced at 160 K. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? There's a ninety thousand dollar dealer markup on this car. Yeah, like, yeah. I wasn't. I'm not a buyer on one of those, but I was buying a different car there. Um, but yeah, I was. I was just blown away. Like this. That's crazy. Keith, you are actually in the market for that bike or car. No, you're I'm just. Not. You're just not at that price. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> we talked about this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's very True. important. Okay. Got me. You got me. Okay. Um. So yeah, uh, the the bikes that Harley builds that sell the best are not their cheapest bikes, um, and that's because value is what really people want. Um, and so just because you can get 90% of the bike for 30% less doesn't actually mean people are going to choose that. They'll actually pay a disproportionate amount more to get that last 10% well if said. it lines yeah. up with exactly yeah. what they want. Yeah. Well said. Um, and you know, the dealer markups are actually a perfect example of why price isn't a determinate demand. Cause again, those dealers, I'm sure, you know, they're able to get the markup in they're many still cases. Bikes. Yeah. So yeah. If they can't, then they'll lower their markup, right? Because that's just inherently how the market works, right? If you're not selling your good, then suddenly you, you lower the price of it. So I sell more. Yep. I do want to talk about, okay, well, let's say that Harley's, everything we've talked about is, are Harley's more expensive? And have they gotten more expensive? And are they too expensive? Um, and what can Harley do about that? But let's just say they are more, they are too expensive, right? People actually just can't afford them right now because of things whether they're in Harley's control or not in Harley's control um, with relation to the economy and consumer preferences, that kind of stuff. Let's just say they are too expensive. What can Harley do to make the bikes cheaper? Um, because I think this is a really important discussion to have because people keep calling for the price to be lower, but then when you actually ask them, okay, well, what are you willing to, to do yeah. to get that, right? And you immediately realize that what they were actually saying was I think Harley has a crazy markup on there because I'm not willing to accept any reduction in any of the things you're about to dis- you know, we're about to discuss like quality and stuff. But like I that. want the price to be lower. Yeah, and you know that very quickly people see people start to realize in their head. Okay, well, I'm I'm basically just saying that Harley has a crazy markup, and as we discussed earlier, no company sabotages themselves with a crazy markup when they could make more money by selling more product at a lower price, but still making more money overall, right? Because as we discussed, it's what's the price that you had to pay to make it versus how many are you going to sell versus how much are you making Mm -hmm. per, and you get a hard number. And companies are constantly calculating that number and adjusting that number. And Harley does this as well with promotional financing or factory rebates or whatever they're going to do. 
Um, so as soon as you realize that that doesn't make sense, then you have to go into, okay, well, how can they actually make things cheaper? So uh, the first thing that you can do is um, basically uh, lower the amount you're spending on R&D, or it's one of the things you can do, right? Mm -hmm. So companies have to spend money to develop their product, make them better over time, keep up with competitors. Usually reducing your R&D budget is very, very bad um, uh, obvious, for obvious reasons. Your competitors get ahead of you. Your consumers get upset because your product, your product lineup stagnates. Yeah. A whole variety of different problems. No new stuff. Yeah. No ahead. new stuff. Um, there's smart ways that you can do it. Okay, and Harley has actually done a lot of the smart things that you can do to reduce your R and D load. You can share engines across multiple uh, product lineups. You know, you can have multiple models based upon the same product. Cars are starting to do this more and more, and they're actually yeah. doing it across companies, right? The new yeah. Toyota Supra, the underpinnings of it are a BMW, and it's made in Austria, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of outcry about that um, because yeah, we don't I found like out it. that on my my wife's Durango. Like, I took it into the shop to have the transmission worked on, and the guys tell me like, "Oh, it's the same transmission in the Mercedes, and the same transmission yeah. in a BMW." And like, the, the ZF, I'm like, are you yeah, serious? Right now? It's like the same company making this. Yeah, yeah. That's it's a ZF eight speed. Yeah. They just throw it in everything. And they they put in everything. Yeah. yeah, and and it makes sense because now that R and D cost for that spread amazing transmission out over. is spread out over everything. Well, it, the reliability is going to be better. Everything's yeah. better yeah. when you do that. When um, you have these companies that are these big conglomerates that own five different makes of vehicles, yeah. so yeah. of course they're going to do that. They're do but it, yeah. they're even doing it across things where, like I said, with like BMW and Toyota, mm -hmm. there's no ownership really, there, right? That's interesting. But know that. there's an understanding that it's going to cost so much money to develop this platform that neither of us could sell enough units to justify the existence of this model unless we share the development costs. So um, Harley does that internally very, very well, right? Essentially, we, we have four models that we sell, right, with different, you know, uh, features on yeah. them, treatments on them to make them better or, you know, you know, better suited for different types of riding. Right. Okay? Um, and that's the, the smart way to go because you're able to keep your R and D costs down while offering a lot of different variety to your customers that is going to offer them a lot of value, right? Because if you only have one model. It's going to line up with one guy really well and he's going to be happy to pay for it, but you're going to have 90 guys that are like, they don't see the value there because they've got to change this. They've got to change that. They've got to take the, they're paying for stuff they don't need, or they've got to go and go to the parts catalog and add you know, stuff that, that isn't on the bike from uh, yeah. the beginning. seems like well, most, most of Harley's like R and D expenses more like in styling or traditionally has been more in styling because they don't tend to offer new brand new models and brand new products all that often. And no, yeah. they're a lot of their like mechanical, like, you know, like physical R and D on the powertrain stuff is more driven by, um, emission standards and meeting, mm -hmm. you know, like people don't consider that like just to, you can only reduce your R and D cost so much and still be able to sell, offer your product for sale with today's regulations and things exactly. getting, you know, worse every or more stringent every year. You have to R and D if you don't, you're, you're soon your products and be obsolete and unsellable because you d can't meet the regulations that are required, you know? Yeah. And you've got to, you got to plan way, way in yeah. ahead because you've got to be like, okay, if I'm going to make this motor for the next 10 years, I don't have to meet today's standards. I've got to meet the standards yeah, of a decade the, from yeah, now, a decade from now. So, mm -hmm. and Harley, I think doesn't benefit that much from other R and D too, from other motorcycle companies because oh. yeah. they're building, no one built like I, I think people think that this is a weird thing that Harley just wants to use old technology, right? But they, they developed the M8 very recently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After they had already had a double overhead cam motor, right? A, a, an amazing one that they had help from Porsche designing. So it's not like some thing they slapped together, you know, like this is an extremely nice motor that was in the V-Rod. Very well they're, engineered. They're using it ag again um, as a, the basis or foundational architecture with a lot of changes for the new Revolution Max. I'm assuming that's why they're call calling it you know, hearkening back to the revolution, mm -hmm. uh, name. Um, they, they made a very conscious decision when they designed the M eight to build what is, I think you know, it's, you could say it's one of the, the coolest motors that currently exists, but it's definitely one of the weirdest ones that an, a modern manufacturer of any powertrain, you know, we're talking, you know, cars, you know, motorcycles, it's really weird. And it's not something you would do normally unless you were going for a very specific character, right. which Harley is right. Yeah. Harley could build a liquid-cooled V-twin. They have in the past. They've developed them as far back as the Nova project. They had liquid-cooled V-4s mm -hmm. that were running. They had blueprints for liquid-cooled V-6s back in, like, the 80s. The reason they don't build that for their cruisers is because what you need in a cruiser is adequate power and then lots of character, right? Yep. Um, so that's what the M8 was designed for, and that's why that motor exists. It's not like a, 
um, you know, hey, we, we can save money on R&D by going off on a completely random direction that no mm-hmm. one else has gone off on. It's like, no, that's actually probably more expensive. The R&D that Harley spends on these weird motors that no one else makes is probably more expensive at this point because there's no... There's no other people it's trailblazing nice. the path Their for own. you, right? Yeah. Well, and I talk well, about the this. I talk about this all the time too. Things. Like when I talk about the M8, like that that engine struck the perfect balance between modern technology and still retaining that that character that we talk about so yeah. often. Yeah. Uh, striking a balance between those two things yeah. to where you're not going to alienate alienate those guys that say, "Oh, that doesn't sound like a Harley." Yeah. I mean, I can't I can't count the number of times I heard people say, "Oh, that sounds like a, a Yamaha or." It's funny because you have people on both sides of the spectrum, you know, and, and this is kind of getting off on a tangent, but you, you have people that criticize Harley for not being technical, technologically advanced enough, and you have the people that whenever they do come up with something new, it's, well, that, that's not a Harley anymore. Yeah. So I feel like the, yeah, the M8 struck that line. perfect balance between those yeah. two yeah. things. And we've talked about this before. I think there's yeah. just a lot of people that want, you know, Harley's seen as the big the big dog, right? And it's always fun to attack the big dog um, and, you know, try to bring him down a notch because, you know, when when Indian launched the the Challenger and it was a aluminum frame, it doesn't have a you know it's a bagger with an aluminum uh, uh, a frame that's cast. It's got mm-hmm. a liquid cooled motor in it, right? And I was like, oh man, the Harley purists are just gonna burn these guys down, right? Because you can't build an overhead cam, you know, V twin with all this stuff and have anybody not crucify you for it if you're in the Harley community, right? I mean, the V rod was like a one off thing. It wasn't even like a a thing that like took over the the like a mainstay of Harley yeah. Davidson. It's like this is the new bagger, right? It was just right. like here's a side thing that we're doing. It that's like, fun. It was like one or two models depending yeah. on what year. Yeah. And they still got crucified for it, right? Oh yeah. Um and then Indian comes out of this and everyone's like Harley, I'm like, how come you're not putting Brembos on it? It's like <laughs> yeah. Harley's standing over there like we've been putting Brembos on them for like the last five years. Yeah. Like what are you yeah, talking about? You know, so yeah. marketing. Um it's it's insanity to me when you see that, right? Um because Harley goes and spends all this R and D to build this just really amazing weird motor that has amazing character that pays tribute to their heritage and then indian comes out with this v-twin that makes more power and it's like harley it doesn't even make that much more it's like 15 yeah. more rear wheel horsepower and it's <laughs> like out of 1800 cc's it's like ducati's like making 200 horsepower out of a <laughs> thousand right and it yeah you can look at torque and power delivery and you know one's moving around to 300 yeah i, I get into the, the weeds with it right but it's not like some uh, like earth shattering amount of power that we've never seen before yeah. out of it like you know, the V-Rod made as much horsepower, you know, pretty much. Uh, it's not, like, Harley did that a long time ago. And the yeah. new Revolution Max. But it's, like, the reason we like the M8 is not because of how much power it makes. Like, if you were in the market for a bike that made tons and tons of horsepower, if you're buying an M8, like, like you're not buying... No, you're not buying, you're not right buying the right bike, right? Yeah. It's not a race bike. It, it's supposed to... It's like a Bentley or it's like a Rolls-Royce, right? When you ask the Rolls-Royce salesman how much horsepower the car makes, right, they just look at you, like, enough. Like yeah. what? What do you? Ta- it makes enough, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's it's very smooth. You'll never know there's an engine running. It does exactly what it's supposed to do, right? With the Harley, it's kind of the opposite, right? You know, it <laughs> makes enough power and it has the character you're looking for. It's got the classic sound. It's got the classic feel. It's got everything that you want from that the power. Visceral point, feeling right? that we always talk yeah. about. Harley will not throw that away. So they're working within that that self imposed limitation. And for a good reason, they yeah. don't throw it away. Like so that would be a travesty if they did. That's what they're so, good at. So that's yeah. kind of a, the tangent, right? But uh, that we we. We we get off on tangents. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah. Just, if I can add, one well, thing yeah, just hey. just to like turn like to tell you like the power of R and D where it can either make or break a company. Like the Indian before its the current iteration, when it first came back out, you know it was a different thing, and they were trying to make a different product on based on the same ideal, you know, V twin platform, and they started. Uh, they spent an immense amount of money uh, for like, the company that are size at the time researching the powerhouse 100 at the time which was like supposed to be like their their crown jewel motor well eventually bankrupted them um yeah. so much so that they had to basically they did bankrupt and go into liquidation and get bought out eventually and and be what they are now but um just my point there is like r&d when flipped on its ear and letting the engineers just take over your company will put you out of business yeah, like, you got to yeah. be as we discussed smart about it and yeah. i think you know what got us off on this tangent is that harley is pretty smart about it um even though their motor's very expensive to design, they're using it across a lot of platforms. Yep. You know, it's not like BMW where they developed that one motor that's just in that one bike for right now. I mean, that's, talk about expensive, right? Um, you know, the new liquid cool platform, it's it's modular. That's the idea behind it, right? You can use it for a lot of different models. Um, so those are all the, 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 the things with R&D that you can do. Um, but in terms of what else you can do to cut the cost, right? Because that's kind of what got us on this, dis, you know, discussion. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, 
another thing that you could do would be to re reduce your marketing, right? But the main folly with that idea is it sounds good on paper, right? Because who wants to pay for the advertising of the company that you're buying the product from is that um, marketing is, is, is so incredibly important that it, it's almost hard to over exaggerate how important it is. And I think the, the funniest way to think of this as a real world example is if you watch uh, MotoGP right now, um, Ducati is sponsored by a company called Mission Winnow. Do either of you know what Mission Winnow makes or sells? No oh, idea. Only because you told me. Yeah. So I, I relayed this to Matt before, but this will, this will be new for you, Keith. Yeah. But Mission Winnow is, is, is not a real company. I mean, it's a real company, but it's not a real company. They don't make anything. Okay. <laughs> they don't make anything. They don't offer any services. They don't do anything. Mission Winnow is a company that was set up by Marlboro uh, Cigarettes. It's a tobacco okay. company, but they're not allowed to advertise. So Cigarettes, they have yeah. Mission Winnow and they kind of made their logo look kind of similar. And then they had other things where they were like trying to make it at speed when it's going by like on a, on a camera where uh -huh. it looks like the logo. Okay. But marketing is so important that Marlboro spends money to sponsor both Ferrari in Formula One and Ducati and MotoGP, not particularly inexpensive things yeah, to and do. If anyone's I would been imagine. racing before, that is not cheap. <laughs> yeah, those are the two most expensive series that you could yeah. potentially get yourself into on two of probably the most expensive teams, other than maybe like, you know, at this point, Mercedes uh, for Formula One and uh, Repsol Honda for MotoGP, but two of the most expensive teams, essentially. And your product isn't even being advertised. Okay? <laughs> you're advertising a shell company. Yeah, you're advertising. You hope yeah. some of them will <laughs> well, own no, it. Yeah. Or that somehow, subconsciously, it's going to make you want to go smoke cigarettes. Or right? they'll do the research and be like, yeah. oh, this is a company that oh, is related to Marble. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll go, I'll go, yeah. go buy some cigarettes now. Yeah. So the idea that Harley should start advertising less or spending less on marketing, I mean, you might argue they should be more efficient about their marketing. They need to change their marketing you know, sure. strategy. Any of those things could be valid potential arguments, right? But to spend less money on marketing when demand for your product is down and it's one of the few levers you have to control demand for your product, as we discussed. Yeah, you don't um, cut that. You don't cut that. If anything, you need to expand that and you need yeah. to have better marketing. And be smarter about it. And be it. smarter about it, yeah. right? So... Um, anyone who says spend less on marketing does not fundamentally understand how important it is. And you need to look to Mission Winnow as an example of how important <laughs> it is. Even if you can't advertise your product, you need to be advertising your product, okay? That's, That's how wild. important advertising is, no okay? I no idea about that. That's yeah. wild. That was interesting when you told yeah. me that, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's, again, it's one of those things you don't want to think about when you're spending money on this product. Oh, I'm buying advertising for Dodge right now, right? When I buy this Dodge. But it, it's, it's an essential thing. You, you, you can't cut it. So what about cheaper components? Okay, so there's a variety of ways you can you, you can build the bike out of cheaper components, but it generally leads to frustration for the consumer, right? And, and pretty much no one is going to be on board with that, with the exception of we made our manufacturing costs lower by using maybe more automation. So the good, the quality of the good is not only better, it was also cheaper, right? Because a uh, computer made it precise and yeah, well, because we're not paying labor. Yeah. And it's good. Right? The, the, uh, the flip side of that argument, though, is if you're Harley, so you automate more and yeah. you lay off a bunch of workers and then you get a bunch of negative press. Right, negative press, yeah. Saying yeah. They, yeah, they that Harley's, Harley's, you know, trying to dip, get more money by automating their assembly line and they put, you know, 10,000 workers out of, or how many ever workers yeah. out of business. And then all of a sudden it's like, you all this negative press and no one wants to buy your product because you're now, you know, anti-American yeah. worker. So yeah, it's, it's a very fine line. And, and that's the thing too. You, at this point, we kind of all need to realize that's the general direction things are going. And unless yeah. you want to pay for a handmade good, which is only going to get more and more expensive over time, the reality is that automation is is here. It's a thing, and it, companies need to utilize it, or they will be uncompetitive because your competitor right. will use it, and they'll do a better job of hiding it. And then you know the negative press well, is, is perfect never example out. of yeah. like in a, on a small scale of what you're talking about, both advertising and you know and production is like look at rusty butcher like he's hand making yeah. leather goods and he's amazing at so social media and marketing and everything and people he can't keep his stuff in stock i mean yeah. they're buying his website out every time he releases something because he's and he's still making it by hand yeah. so they appreciate the quality because he's making a quality product by hand exactly. and he's great at advertising yeah so like just trying to amplify what you're saying like exactly. on a small scale that he's doing he's doing it the right way which harley's pretty much doing the same thing on a larger scale, you know? Yeah, so they're, you know, Harley is and ha has refused for the most part to cut, you know, quality overall. If any, anything, if you look at the, the fit and finish of the new soft tail compared to the old Dyna frame, you know, models, yeah. I, I would say on average, they're put together better. Um, you know, 
the, the new soft tails that is. Um, yeah, and that's heavily scrutinized as well. When people come yeah. in and they look at a bike, I mean, I remember when uh, like the streets came out, that's mm-hmm. a lower price product, but you had things like plastic switch housings, the uh, you know wiring harnesses and everything weren't as well hidden. Well, and yeah, but people then, right away yeah. were like, that's not a Harley. You know, exactly. that's like people people love to say that phrase. And yeah. I, I, I wish I could you slap can, people every once in a yeah, while. I mean, when yeah, when you sit on them, you can, you can feel a difference. Like when you sit on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can feel it. Like so, so if they cut that, that you know, they pulled that, like like Nick's saying, and they reduced the quality, like no one would like that. Nobody wants that. That's not going to help you sell more bikes. Yeah. No. Yeah, even before I high-sided my Jixer, like <laughs> when you pushed it around, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which, yeah, in fairness to the Jixer, now I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised when it creaks and stuff like that. Like the plat, like everything, the way it fits together, it's, it's clearly all of the money went into the motor and the chassis. None of it went into anything else, right? Yeah. Which is fine, right? Because I'm going to high side it. I don't want to spend a lot of money on the plastics, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's fine that they allocated their resources that way. Right. But every company has to choose how to allocate their resources. And yeah. Harley, I, I think, has built its entire reputation in, in most regards in terms of how amazing the bikes look in terms of fit and finish and design. Right. And I think sacrificing those would be disastrous. Okay. Because that's what people associate it with it to the point where exactly. if something doesn't meet the standard, people attack it as not even being from the exactly. company. Exactly. Not even like, Oh yeah, Harley, you know, it doesn't really live up to my expectations of the products. They gen- no, it's mm-hmm. like, no, that's not a Harley Davidson. Yeah. Right. Get a real one. They go you know, right like, to the extreme. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the idea that they would cut down and, and make things cheaper, you know, in terms of cutting quality, I think would be disastrous, right? Because then you're, you're actively destroying your reputation. And yeah, sure, there's the guys that they don't notice. We see bikes get traded in where it sat outside. Someone didn't care about how nice that thing was. I mean, if it sits outside, fine. I mean, but like they never washed it. They never waxed it. Yeah, they never, never they never maintained it, right? We see it, it not, it's, it's relatively rare because most people buying their Harleys know what they're buying and they love their bikes and it's their baby and they appreciate the quality. And It's we a see, premium motorcycle. We see bikes know, like my dad's FXR from... 35 years ago that you could put it on the showroom almost other than the rock chips, you know, yeah, that, you know, it's clean. Yeah. It's because the quality was there. It was maintained and it was respected. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we, no one wants to see Harley cut those things. So, um, you can also assemble them overseas, which Harley does, but not for anything sold here. Right. So it doesn't affect us pricing, but, uh, to get around tariffs and other, and that you did a whole great video on this that was, you know, spurred by political things we won't get into, but, right. um, you know, obviously to get around tariffs, Harley has operated what are called complete knockdown facilities. So you, you make all the parts in the same places you were going to make them anyways, and then you ship them to a different assembly facility just to get around the tariff. Yeah. Um, no one is going to accept, and, and, I mean, I guess maybe they do accept it because a lot of people do think that Harley makes bikes overseas that they sell here. I mean, half the time someone walks past a, a, a street, they go, isn't that the one that's made in India? And it's like, well, yeah, but also there's other models made in India too, but that's that one wasn't made in India. Um, that one was made you know, in most likely in Kansas city before and yeah. now they're all made in York. They but read a headline and they think that Harleys are now made <clears throat> overseas. Yeah. yeah. They and clicked on somebody's clickbait article or something. Exactly. Something and, and that's why discussions like this are kind of important for people to, if you're really invested in the brand to listen into, because if you're just reading a headline on something, you're going to miss a lot of the gray mm-hmm. area and almost all, you know, things live somewhere in the gray area uh, of reality. So yeah. against, obviously people are against, it's just to recap some of the things we've covered. They're against less R and D, right? Cause they want Harleys to continue to improve and be competitive with their competitors. Uh, less marketing. They might be on board with that, but in five years when Harley doesn't exist cause they don't market anymore, they're not going to be on board with that. And then cheaper components, they're not going to be on board with that, right? Because they want to be able to pass their bike down to their kid. Um, you know, more outsourcing. No, I mean, it's an American brand. You got to make the bike that you're selling in America, in America. And, you know, obviously it's a global company and components of the bike are made over overseas. I think 90% of the world's wiring harnesses are made in Mexico at this point. Like pretty much everything yeah. is a global company at this point. Yep. But every time I've done research on this and looked into it, it looks to be that Harley is building some of the most American machines that you can currently buy, which would put you at about like the 70 to 75% ratio. So things like the Corvette and Bowling Green, Kentucky, that's like kind of the ratio where they hit, um, Oddly enough, I think like the Toyota Camry is like around there, yeah. even though it's Japanese, right? <laughs> um, so uh, the most American goods that you can possibly buy are in that 70 to 75% margin. And most of the stuff that isn't made on, on the Harley in America is is then made in places where it's not like Harley was doing it to save a lot of labor costs. It's like the suspension is, I'm assuming, made in Japan by Showa because that's where 
most Showa suspensions made, unless you know Harley has a license to manufacture it here and Showa just designs it. Um, but it's not like you're building things in Japan to save labor, you know, right? Yeah. Um, you're doing that because Showa makes nice suspension and they've been your suspension partner forever. And so they manufacture it for you. Um, yeah. right. People don't usually have an issue for that. They just don't want everything being outsourced for cheaper labor because that hurts American labor, you know, uh, rates, you know. And, well, and at the end of the day, they, yeah, as long, I think as long as it's assembled and mostly built in, you know, United, United States. States yeah. And, you know, right now is a perfect example. Like a lot of the companies that are not doing so well are, getting their, you know, raw material and materials from overseas more, you know, than, than the domestic stuff. So the companies that have domestic, you know, raw material and domestic production, they don't have to worry about COVID lockdowns and stuff like that. And other than operating with them, whatever County that they're in or state that they're in, you know, parameters, but you know, like you like a lot of little guys too, like the aftermarket companies we see like Krauss for is a good example. They get all their product, all their raw material domestically and they, all their production is domestic. They haven't slowed down at all. Yeah. But a lot of these other companies that get stuff from overseas, they're they're in all effective purposes out of business at the moment because they can't get their the supplies. They yeah. can't get the supplies they need to make their product. You know. And people also need to put you know their money where their mouth is too. Yeah. You know, we. I mean, how many bikes do we come in with fake makers on them? Do we see? You know. Uh, yeah. I don't know if people know this, but you know, JW Speaker is the supplier for harley for the day maker the basically harley gives them i'm, I'm sure a aesthetic you know yeah. and says we need a light that fits this aesthetic because harley's day makers are much nicer looking than their counterpart mm -hmm. jw speaker headlight in most cases um but those are made in the united states and then everyone's like oh it's a waste of the day, ma the day makers a waste of money it's overpriced you can get an ebay you know chinese copy of it for half the price and it's like yeah you can because they didn't have to do any R&D, right? right? They copy and it. they're making it in China. Yeah. They're they're cheaper, cheaper yeah. quality. They're going to fail yeah. more. Yeah. And even if they didn't, right, of course they're less expensive. They're stealing the R&D of an American company, right? So it's not that, you know, this, this good is equivalent, right? They're not equivalent, right? Because if you look at actual costs to manufacture it, the R&D budget that goes into making it exists for one of those companies and it doesn't exist for the other. So, you know, if you can't afford the day maker, you're fine. Right, I understand, and and you want an upgrade, and you want a safer light, so you get the LED one. Okay, I understand not purchasing the Daymaker, or maybe not even purchasing the JW speaker, which tends to be a slightly less expensive, albeit a little. Bit yeah, the reason behind that too, just to you know give you background, is material like the the uh, the lens over the JW speaker's poly, uh, polycarbonate. Okay, yeah, or plastic, you know, instead for of glass. inside of glass. The yeah. Daymaker from Harley's glass, it's got a better, you know, it. It resists, you know, rock chip or, you know, road grime and rock chips and yeah. bugs and stuff, but more. And you can, you know, you can scrub it with a, with, with a, uh, scotch bright pad and it's not going to scratch it. And you do that to the polycarbonate lens and We've you ruin your trade. light. Yeah. yeah you oh, ruin man. your light. That was, so. that was, yeah. So Dur durability is a yeah. big, that's big on those. Yeah. But, uh, obviously, you know, between the two in terms of actual labor of building in the U S you know, it, it's, it's going to be the same. And then you go to China, of course, it's going to cost a lot less to make that. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's important to consider factors like that as well. Um, and that people need to understand that that adds to the price of the product, of course. Um, and you have to be willing to pay for that. Um, yeah. if you don't see value there, you don't see value there. And I'm not trying to argue that you should. Yeah. Um, we have that conversation at our service counter all the time. And the big one is about round lights, uh, auxiliary, you know, like passing them lights are a big one right now. Cause you can go on Amazon and buy what looks like the same light that, or the same kit that Harley offers physically looks like it but it's really not and we yeah. s we've seen quite a few of them lately and we have to have that you know conversation with the customer like hey so a lot, back up a little bit a lot of shops won't even take parts that you bring in and put them on we, yeah. we will do that but within reason so like you know the harley one everything plugs right in like it's real pretty real simple, e yeah. easy to put on the amazon one that come from wherever in china doesn't have all the connectors and everything you need so we got to get those for you we have to then fix the wiring to make it plug in plug in like the Harley one is it's not and the we same charge thing for it too yeah, and we have to charge for that so the savings yeah. you got by buying on Amazon yeah. is now negated my point exactly and then people are upset with you too or they'll bring yeah. in you know wrong wrong the wrong part and they're like well, we'll make it work you know and well yeah because like, the Harley kits you know three or four hundred bucks yeah. and the Amazon one's hundred but it costs twice a, twice what you paid for to put it on because you have to do all these modifications to it to actually even make it work yeah because it's made for you know and that, thousands of different things that bit kind of brings us that's a that's a, a quality thing too so yeah. people don't want people to you know people don't want harley to cut quality obviously they want it to be cheaper though they don't want to cut quality um and, and things like that are are definitely areas where harley could with a lot of people and 
a lot of people wouldn't maybe even notice. Most people probably don't know that the daymaker is made here. Yeah. They could make it in China and they could justify it as saying, well, pretty much all electronics are made there. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but they haven't done that. So, uh, it's it's definitely an important thing to consider, um, that if you're not constantly pushing and and wanting things made here, that companies are going to automatically do that because if you, you put your money just on the cheaper product every single time, you're, you're really forcing the company's hand, right? right. So, yeah. um, you know, it's just important to consider that. Yeah. So, um, I guess the last thing to talk about, and we've kind of touched up base on it a little bit, was really just uh, before you know uh, Keith goes into, I guess he's going to talk about stage two. Stage, stage two, two. Yeah. Um, is is just what what can Harley do then to expand their sales? Um, you know, if if lowering the price isn't the solution, right? Because either you know they can't just cut the price as we discussed. That doesn't. That's not how economics works. And everything that they could do really to lower the price of the bike they've already either done by being efficient with their R and D or would cut quality in ways or cut other things in ways that we don't want them to do. Right. So if money isn't the thing that they, the lever that they pull on then then what do we want to see them do? And I think we're constant advocates for new types of models that we want to see. You know, we haven't really talked about it much as of late, but for example, when we built the coast glide, man, we were, and in our comment section, everyone was just talking about, Hey, I want the coast glide, right? I'm a buyer for the coast glide, but I'm not a buyer at the price of the coast glide, right? Yeah. And it's because we had to disassemble the entire bike Pretty by much, yeah. spend 80 to 120 hours, which is really probably an underestimation of, of what it actually takes to do that, put it together. And so even if you did a vivid black one, you, you simply just, you know, you're, you're priced out of where most people are, yeah. are going to be. I mean, obviously you see the custom builds all the time. So a lot of people are willing to spend that kind of money, but for the average consumer that just walks into the dealership, it's a really awesome bike to look at and it's really something that immediately then goes for them. They're like, I wish Harley built something like that. Um, so we do constantly push Harley to try to build things that we think are going to sell well. So that's definitely one thing, right? Is have your, make sure your product lines up with consumer preferences. So the low rider S yeah. is a perfect example mm -hmm. of that. The blacked out special baggers with the stretch bags, looking at what people are doing in the custom market, uh, uh, market and copying it and iterating upon it and doing it usually better because you can spend more on tooling for bags and you have yeah. the Tomahawk, you know, uh, facility for fiberglass and all that kind of stuff that just, you know, no one has that kind of budget to make something as well as the factory can make it usually. Right. Yeah, actually, no the street glides are a perfect example. Like when they came out like 06, 05, 06, they yes, were like, yeah. yeah, everybody was taking the, the electric light standard and yeah. putting lowered shocks on it, putting a smaller windshield on it, Perfect. putting a oh. radio in it. And, you know, making it cooler and making it basically what the street glide became. And that was like, in my experience, that was Harley's first, like kind of uh tippy toeing into like the taking some concepts that were commonly applied in the aftermarket world on a certain model and turning it into like a production model or at least a basis for, you know, a jump off point. Yeah. You know, well, I think that's what Willie G gets accredited for a lot, too, yeah. is just going to the shows, being out there and being really, you know, hypersensitive to what people want. And um, I feel like. You know, Harley is still pretty good at that, but I feel like they maybe weren't as good maybe in recent years as they were in the past. Um, but yeah, that's that's one thing that I would say is is the biggest thing that Harley Davidson can be doing to drive demand. Well, three things actually um, is you know, being very very sensitive and just really being down in the trenches uh, with what people want in a bike and really listening to to the consumer what they want. That and, you know, creating more riders, I think, is really important. One of the things that I mentioned uh, was that video that I made, and I think one of the things is, is people just growing up in an environment where they are exposed to motorcycles at a young age, I think, is yeah. huge. And that's one that's very hard to control, and it's one that if you can throw a lot of money at that and, and not even make a dent. Harley but bought a whole entire company, the electric bikes, the little electric Stasic. bicycle, Stasic. Stasic. Yeah, I'm they bought a whole company to foster those younger kids riding two-wheeled vehicles. I think that's a really smart thing to yeah. do, especially because I think the presence of e-bikes as everything gets more urban, right? And people are less likely to have licenses for cars over time and therefore motorcycle licenses. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people riding around on e-bikes and that kind of stuff. I so. think, yeah, people, we focus on the e-bike because that bike, those little bikes are, you know, electric. But yeah. um, coming from a family, you know, that we didn't have e-bikes and the frustration of my father trying to teach me how to r clutch and ride a motorcycle um it just makes that process so much easier because you can put your kid on that bike and just turn it on yeah. and let them 
feel the throttle and all of a sudden they're riding like it doesn't take two hours to explain hey this is how the clutch works this is how you shift this is how the brakes work like it's It's so much it's a great gateway and you know i don't i don't by any means think that all those kids are going to grow up to ride e-bikes some of them will some of them most of them probably won't but um at least they're like their their first experience on two wheels is very positive there's no frustration there's no you know yeah. involvement of like an adult trying to like oh, micromanage what they're doing it's like hey yeah. just go ride man it's it's like super simple yeah and then if they move from there to a bigger e-bike cool or yeah. if they move to a gas powered bike with a transmission yeah. they already have the fundamentals of two wheel yeah. motion down so they're not trying to learn both to balance and yep. ride they're only learning now how to shift gears that's super stuff, smart right? so yeah building product that people want i mean obviously in terms of the determinants of demand and what that hits into obviously Mm -hmm. consumer preferences um and then as you mentioned um you know building ridership you know that's again the hardest one one would be number of buyers in the market yeah um and And that's not just harley davidson's job you know it's it's you know something globally that that we need to do and like you said i I think i watched revzilla's uh video as well on just how do we increased ridership overall yeah um, but, but my third one would be marketing as well i think you, you got to have the right kind of marketing with the right kind of people done in the right way to maximize your dollar i think you can spend a lot of money on marketing that's totally inefficient exactly but you know nowadays with you know uh, the right influencers out there you know i know harley does a lot of stuff with uh, jason momoa especially recently which i think is is great mm-hmm. um, um i think they had a lot of product placement in the past you know th- we Things we always talk about, like the Terminator movie was huge. Yeah. How do you replicate something like that yeah. nowadays? And that was the biggest home run as yeah. far as, you know, movie integration with their yeah. products yeah. ever. Huge. Um, but I think they could do more of that. You know, they did the Avenger thing, which eh, you can't really tell some of those things are Harley Davidson products. Yeah, um, it's kind of hard. But they I'd were like trying to push, I think, some of the less core stuff at that. They were trying to push some of the new stuff. Live wire, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and which, you know, I guess, you know, obviously that's stuff that you want to market. Um, I think obviously a lot of the stuff that Harley's done that's been most effective has been things where the motor company itself takes a backseat. I think Harley needs to recognize right now that they're not seen as much as I kind of think they are an underdog in a lot of ways. They're not seen as an underdog. Yeah, and they're not. They're seen as a lot, by a lot of people as like a corrupting influence in some ways, right? They're the corporate, you know, they're the, you know, if you, if you view Harley as this kind of, um, you know, rebel, you know, this kind of, I'm, doing this, I'm, you know, social outcast, that kind of element Freedom of it, machine, yeah. suddenly getting to the, the corporate side of it, right? In this day and age is something we've talked about before, especially for younger people. Like, uh, consumerism is not seen as the source of freedom, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, freedom is, is innate, right? Um, you have the right to exercise your freedom with what you're buying, right? But that's not the source of freedom. And, and, and for the most part, like, a lot of people don't view corporations in a particularly positive light they see them as this other element right that's not Greedy in their control and, yeah right. all these negative connotations right. and that's not i'm not saying that's how it should be or how it has always been or whatever but i, I do think the current climate is a lot of people see things especially in that with the way. younger generation yeah, yeah especially absolutely. with the younger community so yeah. uh i think harley is really smart to partner with but not really push themselves as being a big part of like for example born free you know this is just something that builds riders. They're supporting things that build riders that get people into a community where they get exposed to bikes. They get exposed to not just Harleys, but yeah. you know, whatever, you know, custom built choppers that are really nothing, you know, but they, they can still see, okay, well, I can't build that, but I want something that has a similar character, a similar charm. I can that appreciate that. It's yeah. a, 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 you know, maybe a starting point for something like that eventually. And so they they get into Harleys or, you know, they, they give out, you know, bikes to, influencers are super big these days and that has a negative connotation to a certain degree as well but oh, for sure um you know it's not it, it can be bad or it can be good depending on how it's done right so well, you gotta be genuine you gotta be i mean to give a bike to someone who's not a writer in the first place and yeah. be like hey this guy because he's a, a big time rapper or whatever i'm giving my bike like that's not gonna work you gotta yeah. give a bike to a guy that has credibility with his group community. and crowd yeah. his community uh in relation to that specific product that's driving so. innovation, like what the guys that they're giving those bikes to, to, you know, innovate and enter these, you know, like the, like the king of the baggers competition and stuff like yeah. that. I mean, they're innovating, they're making parts, one off parts that are eventually hopefully going to become something that's, you know, usable in a, in a wider, you know, scheme of things. And 
there there's some cool bikes out there. I mean, all those guys that they that they've that they're partnering with, they're doing cool stuff with those bikes, and that's important. I mean, and they're going to learn from that. Harley's going to learn from that too, like the emerging trends and stuff like that. I mean, you know, like you said, Willie G was good at it, and for all intents and purposes, Brad's his replacement, and he's you yeah. know in charge of the styling, and th- he's keyed in, man. Like the Lowrider S, which has been the biggest hit. Yeah, that's him. He that was all him and his guys. And Lowrider the, S, the new CVO new, redesign. Yeah, and the, how no. popular are the CD, CVOs now? They're Dude, huge. They got yeah. stagnant around 16, yeah. 17. They right. were sitting on the floor. Eighteen model year hit, and we couldn't keep them in stock anymore. Yeah, and he's so. like, he's revamped that whole thing. So I don't yeah. think I think they're more than anything today in today's world. They're really tuned into like what's going on. It's it's hard to, for them to move that you know move, bring some of that stuff those concepts to market because it's a lot of engineering and a lot of testing and a lot of you know, stuff like that, that that's kind of a hindrance to, you know, progress, but they need these, you know, younger guys, these little, these smaller guys that can innovate real, real quickly um, to like kind of show them the way like, Hey, here's what you can do with a little bit of imagination and a little bit of know-how and some application of, you know, some things that are, that, that we know about. Um, and that, that that stuff goes a long way. I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of good stuff in that realm. It's, they're doing good. And it, it's hard too, because, you know, something that it's hard for me to kind of get out of the Southern California bubble where we know exactly what yeah. we're going to sell, but you know, that's not always what's going to sell in the entire country or the entire world even. So, yeah. um, I, I always kind of get on my soapbox and say like, Hey, you just made this bike X, Y, Z. It's going to sell so, so well. Well, maybe in Southern California, but yeah. that's not always the case, mm-hmm. you know, around it's the true. country. But yeah. anyway, so it, it's a hard balance to make for the guys over at Harley Davidson to make something that's going to be mass appealing to a lot of people. So, yeah, tough job. Yeah. So the last thing I kind of wanted to say um, is just that uh, I think, and this is something that just as humans we are just prone to. Um, uh, and we talk a lot about economics, but really my, I've spent most of my life studying history. And you see it every time period across every historical period is people look for silver bullets, right? Yeah. They want easy, quick answers mm-hmm. to extremely complicated Don't problems. Want the magic pill. And they like common sense gets valued a lot. And in day-to-day life, that's because yeah. common sense is super important, right? Just in terms of, I'm going to do this this way because this is efficient, right? Yeah. But the unfortunate reality is that uh, actually uncommon problems, like when you try to apply just common sense to them, it actually is oftentimes counterproductive. So um, I just, you know, if you take one thing away from this, in addition to everything we talked about in terms of Harleys, is just be very cautious of anyone suggesting a silver bullet solution to anything, really. So if someone's like, oh, Harleys are just too expensive, it's like, no, no, no. Almost never is it yet just, oh, it's just this, right? Yeah. Um, At least if it's a complicated problem, right? And anyone who thinks that either just doesn't, hasn't spent the time to actually understand the problem um, or they're not interested in understanding the problem. They just, you know, they, they just are saying what they're saying because it just, you know, it's what popped into their It feels good to say it. Good, yeah. And they like yeah. to be, they like to oversimplify things. They're stating their opinion. It's not necessarily based in fact. It's just yeah. their, their perception. They want someone to listen to what they yeah. think and not so much backed up by fact always I've, I've ranted enough today so i won't go into the various <laughs> historical silver bullets that have existed yeah, but yeah. there's a whole bunch of them and they're it's just an interesting topic to dive into if, uh you know if you ever have the chance to go down a rabbit hole like i tend to do but um, give us one in, in in two minutes um so uh the one that i guess point out most often would be like uh, prohibition so uh, alcohol consumption was linked to almost every societal ill at that point in time, right? Oh, uh, children aren't, aren't, aren't growing up and getting a good education because their parents are, are drunk Drinking. and can't, can't educate them. Uh, there's not enough money for food, right? So people are poor because they're spending all of their money on alcohol. Uh, people are jobless because they can't hold down a stable job because they're drunk all the time. Uh, people are not going to church because uh, alcohol is leading them to sin. Um, you know, e- everything that you can imagine any, pretty much any societal ill was linked to alcohol. And I'm not saying alcohol is a good thing, right, or a bad thing, right, but this idea that it was a silver bullet solution to all of the problems that society had, while an appealing argument can be made in abstract about it, as soon as you put it into practice and you look at what prohibition <laughs> actually did, no one goes back and is looking at the history of it and going, yeah, prohibition, was that worked really well, right? <laughs> let's, let's bring that back in. Yeah, everyone yeah. is just like, okay, uh, oh, well, okay, so that's, that's a good 
argument for why things like that probably aren't a good strategy, right? Because you just created a whole bunch of criminals. Everything moved underground. You lost yeah. all your tax revenue. Um, you started locking up people that yeah. would have maybe not have been the best dad in the world, but now they're in prison. Well, they're That's not really yeah. a better alternative to not the best dad is dad in prison is not really the strategy most people want. Right. So uh, you didn't actually solve anything. Uh, all you did was create a whole bunch more problems. Yeah, and they're having the same argument around cannabis right now too. Same yeah. same principles, yeah, same, and, yeah, same well, thing. Yeah, yeah. well, and then, yeah, getting into the drug wars is, yeah. is, is, is it probably not a topic for this. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you even need to just extrapolate that out to Harley, let's say Harley did do exactly what you wanted and they cut their, their profits. Okay, so they, they just cut prices. So they sell more bikes, but they make less money. Okay, now they can't spend any money on R&D. Now their marketing budget is smaller. Now they can't give as much money to relaying related companies in the industry, right, to give them out bikes for free. So there's going to be less goods in the market. Similar, they can't fund uh, rider education to the same degree. So they can't expand rider share, right? So uh, as weird as staff. it sounds, yeah, yeah. yeah they got to cut so staff. Your service when you yeah, call or whatever. They've got to mm-hmm. move more stuff overseas, right? So the quality of the bikes goes down. So you got to be careful what you wish for because almost always because sil- silver bolts are simplified solutions to complicated problems or common sense solutions to uncommon problems, um, you end up just actually making the situation worse. As weird as it sounds, we all want Harley making as much money as possible if you're in, into Harleys. Same thing for me. Like the comp- I worry about companies that I like going out of business because they make things I like. And yeah. sure, another company may pop up. But it's probably going to be different. It's going to have it's a different. Be the same. Yeah, it's never going to be the same. I've seen it happen many, many times. You apply weird solutions or common sense solutions to uncommon problems, and you end up with disastrous results. In yeah. at least historically speaking, lots of cases that are, that are like that. Great, great way to end it. I'm glad we went into the uh, prohibition yeah. statement too. That that's a good kind of analogy for everything. So. Nick needs to start his own podcast. Like uh, shoot, the man. silver bullet or the rabbit hole or yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> there's, there's no. Please, we, we I, may have. You can do something with your infinite amount of research that you do on topics. <laughs> this, this took a very long amount of my own uh, personal time. So we're working on this for like five months. So, <laughs> but um, we yeah, could put like a semi-annual results, podcast out. The results were deep, like deep, deep, yeah. deep topic. Deep dive. Well, there's actually there's good YouTube channels like that. Like, mm-hmm. uh, shout out to like CPG Gray. He does like a deep dive into weird random stuff like tumbleweeds. Where he's like, he'll de- dedicate like two months of his life to figure out why why there's so many tumbleweeds everywhere. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's it, there's definitely people that do good stuff. He's like a that. hobby too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, let us know in the comments below, guys, if if you think we should have Nick as a regular on the podcast. Um, he may be anyways, regardless of what you guys say. But um, I, I would be interested to to hear what you guys think about kind of our conversation around this and kind of getting into things a little bit deeper, maybe a little bit more on, on an intellectual level, um, as opposed to just the shallow level that this topic gets discussed on the internet. Uh, real frequently so yeah let's kind of move on we're um we're a little bit going long but uh, let's go into stage two so a couple podcasts well two or three podcasts ago we kind of introduced uh the performance uh kind of performance upgrades and yeah. most mo- most um specifically the screaming eagle upgrades and we told you guys we we're going to go into the different stage kits and so we're kind of we i think we touched on the stage one yeah we took we went pretty deep on the stage one so if you haven't listened to that at least that part of the podcast um I'm not going to rehash all that stuff, but we talked about stage one. We talked about tuners and their abilities and kind of like aftermarket yeah, exactly. as opposed to Harley. So kind of like laid the foundation for, you know, future uh, performance topics. So I would say, you know, um, listen to that one or at least that portion of that I'll, end of that podcast. I'll link a card in the upper left-hand corner here. You guys can click on that and listen to it if you want. Yeah, we kind of took a break from it because we had some guests in that, that we that didn't really lend themselves well to uh, us continuing the uh, topic of performance. I'm expanding on what we talked about in the stage one discussion, um, which just to rehash real quick, uh, stage one normally is referred to as like an air cleaner, uh, mufflers or an exhaust system, um, and then some kind of tuner to, you know, uh, to calibrate the fuel injection system to the new performance uh, components. I'll review real quick, you know, stock uh, Milwaukee 8 makes generally about 70 to 80 horsepower and about 100 to 110 foot pounds of torque. Stage one, you get about 80 to 90 horsepower, about the same amount of torque, but it's much wider in the RPM range. It goes uh, on a bit farther. Stage two foundation is based on that you already have these things, the air cleaner, the stage one stuff, air cleaner, muffler, and, and a tuner. So stage two is normally um, referred to, or you know, when we, when we say stage two, we're talking about like a camshaft. So camshaft's like the heartbeat of the engine. It controls the airflow both in and out of the engine. It, yeah, it pretty much controls that's a control mechanism or mechanical control mechanism for everything that happens within the motor 
um, mechanically. Just focusing on what we're most familiar with, is, which is the Harley stuff, um, the Harley Stage 2 kit. They offer two flavors or versions. They have the torque cam, and then they have the uh, the power cam. So what's common between these two is um, they come with a set of adjustable push rods, and they also, you can get them in chrome or black. So like a lot of the blacked out bikes, all the Milwaukee 8s come with chrome push rod tubes and, and, uh, and stuff. So you can get them in either either version so if you have a black bike and you want to get the black push rod tubes it comes with a quick install push rod which quickly on the quick install stuff for those that don't um understand that or know about that quick install push rods are normally ones that you can put in without removing the cylinder head or the rocker rocker covers or anything like that so um, what we normally do in that instance is we we use a pair of bolt cutters and cut the stock push rods out um it allows you to save a lot on labor as far as like installation goes and time and effort, you know, needed to, especially on Milwaukee, you don't have to remove the oil cooling lines and all these things that are running over the rocker boxes to, to remove the push rods as opposed that's to. That's something that's kind of unique to Harley Davidson too, because you know, a lot of these engines out there like to, to change the camshaft yeah. in, in, in an engine, like you gotta, it requires a heck of a lot There's more a labor. Lot. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and even, you know, we talk about, and we'll talk about, you know, in the future, the, you know, piston and cylinder changes. You yep. can't change the piston and cylinder in a lot of engines without removing the entire engine out of the bike. True. So that's true. You know, it's kind of something that's kind of cool and unique that you can do in a Harley, these yep. upgrades. So, sorry. Yeah. So, um, just focusing. So like on the torque cam, for instance, um, that's, you know, more for, that's really geared towards like touring bikes, like heavier bikes, bikes that torque is really the, the acceleration that you feel. Um, looking at these things, like I was really surprised the amount of torque you can get out of like just that cam is peak wise is equivalent to like a stage three kit so um the horsepower on those is about the same you know it's like 90 to 100 horsepower on the torque cam and 100 to 120 foot pounds of torque so 120 foot pounds of torque and it's like at 3500 rpm is that's huge that's a big improvement again you know you're talking about um you know like 10 percent more you know torque than stock that's big yeah well and i just uh recently rode the 131 yeah which is way more displacement as they yeah. say there's no replacement for displacement yep. and that that engine puts out 131 foot pounds of torque right so if you're saying the the stage two with a torque cam puts out 120 is that what you said yep 120 foot pounds so of torque. it's going to be a little bit more peaky where you don't have access to that power and it has broad of a range right. uh, of the the rpm spectrum but still to only get 11 foot pounds of torque less than yeah. a 131. I mean, that's pretty significant. Yeah, it makes it for, it makes it from like 3,500 to about like 4,000, maybe a little bit higher than 4,000. So it's not super broad, but that's where most, you know, touring you street ride riders is. are going to ride, right? Yeah. Um, in comparison, like the power cam, which is a little bit larger camshaft, it's got longer duration on it, um, a little more lift. Um, it makes like 100 to 105 horsepower um, and about 105 to 110 foot pounds of torque. So not that much more horsepower, but it's shifted further up in the RPM range. Um, so that's going to lend itself more to, you know, like a lighter bike, like a soft tail or something like that. Like in my personal, you know, feeling about it is I wouldn't really recommend that cam for um, touring customers. They When they talk to me about these, I always, you know, recommend the torque cam for touring bikes because they're a lot heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, they they can really benefit more from that extra, you know, increase in torque than they can from the few more more horsepower they can make on the top end um, because of the nature of riding that they do on that kind of bike and stuff like that. Um, the lighter the bike, the less, you know, you need to depend on the torque to get you going. The, the power to weight ratio is not as, um, it's not as, as critical as those the big bikes, you know, the big bikes really need that, that extra, which is, which is and this can lead to a huge tangent, which yeah. we won't get there, but which is why the sport bikes, you know, they're, they're light yep. and they have such really high peaky horsepower mm-hmm. is because they're not as dependent on that low end torque. That right. We need yeah. They don't, Harley. they don't need it to get them going and their, their engines rev much, their much higher and their, the much way they're higher. tuned and everything yeah. all favors that top end. Exactly. That's why so. like, you have a, a truck. It's like yep. oftentimes the advertise the torque rating more than the yeah. advertise the horsepower rating. It's like, we yeah. make a thousand foot pounds of torque. Uh-huh. It's like, that's, wow. That's what's important. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing with that? And like, I can pull this stump from this side of the state. Yeah. <laughs> Cummins, <laughs> Cummins engine is a perfect example. I'll the state line with it, you know? Yeah. It's like, right. The Cummins engine is a perfect example. I mean, there's, you know, there's in the diesel area, there's a V8s and Cummins is an inline six, right? Yeah. It's a big inline six. Um, turbocharged, but like it never gets over like 3,500, 3,700 RPM, but it, yeah. it doesn't need to because at 2,000 RPM, it's making, 
some stupid amount of torque you can move a house with, yeah. and they don't need to rev the, that engine up. It's, you know, it doesn't need to do that. So, right. um, but yeah, anyways, so just expanding on that, and like Matt alluded to, which is a great segue into our next conversation, which will be stage three stuff. There's no displacement for, uh, no replacement for displacement when it comes to making power. Um, and uh, stage three is where we get into that uh, big bore scenario where we're increase, increasing the size of the engine as opposed to, you know, taking what we have engine size wise and making it more efficient with the stage one, stage two examples. Um, we're going to actually talk about when in the future, stage threes and fours and fives that make the, uh, the engines much larger and much, much more power. So with that, um, our cameras run out of batteries, so. Well, we still got, that's why we have three, because we are, yeah. as long as we have one, we're so. good. So next time we're going to try to, depending on, you know, time uh, constraints, we're going to go into the stage three and maybe the stage four. Yep. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot, guys, for watching this podcast, or if you're listening on podcast platform, yeah, thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Let us know in the comments below. If you're listening on the podcast platform, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and give us a rating as well. Let us know what you think. Let us know what we can be doing better as well. You know, yeah. I, I look at that as feedback, and we we make you know we adapt depending on what you guys want or you know how, how you feel we're doing things. And so let us know uh, what your feedback is, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks a lot, guys. See you next time. Later. See ya. Bye. To flight, I need to switch it up. Okay. Got that black boy joy, might do my dance on me.